So, uh, welcome to ICSR, welcome to King's. My name is Peter Newman, I'm uh, director of ICSR, and uh, this is going to be a really, really interesting day. Um, this is not a new topic for some of the speakers that you will hear from today, but it is a new topic, relatively speaking, for a lot of us. Um, arguably, not enough attention was spent on the far right before that horrible day in July 2011, when Anders Breivik in Oslo was carrying out what he called a martyrdom operation. That was a shock, and it raised a lot of questions. I was in America at the time, I was watching the news, and I saw Breivik being described as a neo-Nazi, as a Christian <coughs> terrorist, and quite simply as a mad, crazy gunman. And when I started reading his manifesto the following day, I realized that, in fact, none of these descriptions were a good fit for him. He was far right, no doubt, but he wasn't quite the traditional neo-Nazi. He was Christian and talked about Christian culture, but he also said in his manifesto he didn't go to church and he didn't care much about faith history. So what was he? If we accept that in order to counter a threat, you need to first of all understand what it is that you're countering, and that question seems to be pretty important. I remember with Al-Qaeda, it took us a long time to figure out exactly what the threat was. Um, and to this day, everyone who works in that kind of terrorism thinks it is hugely important to understand nuances, subtleties, to pick up on trends, and how the threat is mutating and evolving. It seems obvious to me that we need to make a similar effort for lack of, lack of a better expression for the far right. <laughs> and that is what this conference is about. It's about understanding what the new far right is, how it differs from the old far right, what the old far right is up to, and what the new far right is doing at this moment in time. And if time permits us to do this, to see what can be done about it. So we brought together a uh, excellent group of experts, academics, practitioners, policymakers, some of our excellent students too, and even some journalists, perhaps the top 100 stakeholders in this country and beyond to have this debate. We're also launching today, after lunch, a new report on the far right, just after lunch. You may have seen some coverage of this already. I have no doubt we won't be finished with this by the end of the day. This is going to be the start, not the end of an ongoing conversation, a conversation that ICSR wants to be at the heart of. Before I introduce the speaker, let me say just uh, thank you to our two partners without whom this event would not have been possible, the Community Security Trust, with whom we've been working on a number of issues for a number of years, and CATS at the Swedish National Defense College, who have co-funded the research that went into this report. So thank you to you. Um, let me now introduce our first speaker, James Brokenshire. Um, James is the security minister in the Home Office. He has been security minister since 2011, and he's been an MP since 2005, a member of the House of Commons Constitutional Affairs Select Committee, initially then shadow minister for crime re reduction um, before the current government came into power. A very honored minister from time to come, illustrates the importance of this event, but it also illustrates how seriously this topic is being taken. The minister is on a very tight schedule, has to be out here before 11, but he's very kindly agreed to take two or three questions after his speech. So thank you again, minister. Look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you. <coughs> Peter, good morning and, uh, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this, uh, this important event. Uh, I'm particularly grateful given the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation's first class reputation in the field of counter-terrorism studies. Uh, I'd also at the outset like to thank uh, our hosts uh, today uh, as well as today's esteemed speakers, the staff at King's College London and for all of you for your combined effort and contribution in staging today's event. 
uh, and I very much hope that you have a very productive, thoughtful and insightful day ahead, uh, even if I'm not able to stay for uh, a large part of it. Uh, I, I very much look forward to hearing a report back on the discussions that you've had during the course of your proceedings today. It's a sad fact of our times that today we are discussing an evolving threat from far-right extremism and the hideous associations and implications of violence that is attributed to it. In 2011, 77 mostly young people were murdered by an unrepentant far-right extremist in Norway. That appalling massacre gave rise to new fears about the nature and potential of the threat of further attacks by similar far-right extremists. In Britain, we've begun to see a worrying phenomenon on our streets, <coughs> groups such as the English Defence League inflaming tensions and spreading hate-filled prejudice within communities. I recognise, too, the huge concerns that the far-right causes many Muslims and Jewish communities and note the support that the Community Safety Trust has given to this conference today. Let me be clear, no matter what the threat, no matter what the brand of extremism, the government has said from the start, we will not allow terrorists and extremists the freedom to go uncontested. Even before the massacre in Norway, we'd been urgently reconsidering the threat from far-right terrorism in the UK. That's why in June of 2011, we updated and published Contest, the government's counter-terrorism strategy. In particular, Prevent, the strand of the strategy that aims to stop people becoming terrorists or supporting terrorism, made explicit that our work had been broadened to encompass all forms of terrorism, including the far right. We're also consulting with our European partners, many of whom have had even graver difficulties with far right extremist groups. We hope to learn from their experiences of how to deal effectively with the challenge posed by the far right. Recently, We've seen how the ugly face of extremism can rear its head in a variety of guises, including that of the far right. It is not insignificant that the biggest arms cache found in England in recent times have been amassed by a bus driver motivated by such ideology. In 2010, two individuals were convicted for preparing a terrorist attack using a homemade poison, and another was jailed for disseminating terrorist publications. Their motivation was linked to the far right. In 2011, 17 people were in prison in this country for terrorist offences associated with far right extremism. Any of these examples could have proved deadly. But it's important to keep the threat from far-right extremism in perspective. All these cases are, without exception, self-starting groups and individuals, rather than part of a centrally directed terrorist organization. The far-right threat is not as widespread or systematic as the Al-Qaeda-inspired threat. And operationally, there are vast differences. But we also notice that at the same time, at its core, the far right appeals to people who share many of the same vulnerabilities as those exploited by Al-Qaeda-inspired extremism. It feeds off the same sense of alienation and questions around identity. And it has the same ambition to reshape the world in an impossible way. The threat is real and our response must be effective. And we can also learn from what we know about the Al-Qaeda-inspired radicalization process. Now, the label far right has been used to cover a spectrum of groups and activities from the political fringe to those that have links to terrorism. But contest, our counter-terrorism strategy, including the prevent strand, is clear. 
it is concerned with those individuals and groups associated with terrorism. It is not focused on those groups, such as the English Defence League, where violence arises as a consequence of demonstrations and marches <coughs> that leads to conflicts on the streets between supporters and opponents. Terrorism, on the other hand, is the use of the threats of violence deliberately designed to influence governments or intimidate the public and is made for the purpose of advancing a political or ideological cause. We know from experience just how important it is we keep our work combating terrorism separate from wider government efforts to promote integration. As previous prevent strategies have demonstrated, mixing counter-terrorism and integration runs the risk of securitizing social policy and giving a false impression the government used these communities only through a security lens. Let there be no mistake, however. This government utterly condemns the actions of these so-called defense leagues and their offshoots. We utterly condemn the offensive anti-Muslim messages they promote. They are divisive and run contrary to the values of respect and tolerance of different faiths and different beliefs. Those values are the essence of our democratic system, and any attack on them is an attack on the basis of our society. Our response has been based on firm and clear opposition by central and local government and effective policing of their demonstrations and any associated crime and disorder. Where necessary, the Home Secretary has banned marches. At the same time, local authorities such as Luton and Blackburn are leading a number of positive local initiatives to bring people together in constructive ways that drive out suspicion and mistrust and leave no room for racism. Searchlight's Educational Trust is also working in four areas where EDL-style activity is deemed high risk to establish community newspapers to counter the EDL's divisive and damaging propaganda. And where appropriate, the Home Office works ally alongside the De Department for Communities and Local Governments to ensure a joined up approach in addressing the challenges posed by the EDL and similar groups. This work, as I've said, is separate from our counter-terrorism strategy. But we also recognise that we must stay attuned to where community and public order challenges may start to move into the counter-terrorism space. The narratives groups such as the EDL use as their capital, engendering fear and distrust about large sections of our communities, have the potential to stoke radicalisation. There are a growing number of examples which suggest extremist and terrorist groups can potentially destabilize each other, the presence of one causing a spiraling effect on the other and offering an enemy against which to define themselves. This goes beyond public order. There are also views that groups such as defense leagues can provide gateway ideologies through which individuals may migrate to more extreme organizations. Where these lines blur from a counter-terrorism perspective is where the real risk and in our interests lie. We need to understand more about these groups, how they impact on radicalization, and whether activities such as EDL marches act as recruiting grounds for the far-right extremist groups. We also need to understand whether they enhance vulnerability and, if so, how this can be curtailed. One important organisation in helping us understand this picture is the National Domestic Extremism Unit, which acts at a national level to collate and analyse intelligence in order to support UK policing in relation to all matters of domestic extremism, including far-right extremism. But many of the challenges we face with far-right extremism mirror those from Al-Qaeda-inspired terrorism, although, as I've said, on a much smaller scale. 
For example, there is the risk from lone individuals. We've seen a number of self-starting far-right terrorists who have tended to act alone rather than act as a group. But this phenomenon is not exclusive to the far-right. Nor do they exist in a vacuum without reference to group ideologies or materials. Some of the ideologies we see on the far right contain sickeningly familiar themes, such as anti-Semitism and racism. Now too, we see anti-Muslim sentiments, and over and over again, these groups insisting that Muslims cannot live in this country in accordance with our values. They are wrong. Just as with Al-Qaeda-inspired terrorism, we have seen there is no single pathway to radicalization, and a whole host of factors can have a role in creating vulnerability. All this adds up to a dynamic, complex picture, which is why PREVENT adopts a comprehensive, wide-ranging approach. Firstly, we seek to challenge terrorist ideologies. This includes addressing aspects of extremism where those concepts support terrorist ideology and creates an environment sympathetic to it. In the past, we've seen extremist speakers coming to this country to foment hatred and provoke others to violence, exploiting the freedom of speech we value so much. This has stopped. Wherever possible, the Home Secretary has denied entry to individuals, including those from the far right. <coughs> But we also need to make sure we're being effective where it matters most at a local level. We're currently funding 112 projects in areas where radicalization is considered high risk. These include projects aimed at unpicking the narratives of the far right. Secondly, we're providing practical help to prevent vulnerable people from being drawn into terrorism through our flagship intervention program, Channel. Channel is similar to other programs aimed at stopping young people from becoming involved in harm such as gang culture or gun crime. All terrorist and extremist organizations seek to recruit people to their cause, and it is vital that we protect the vulnerable from exploitation and manipulation. About 10% of the individuals subject to channel cases have been motivated by far-right extremism. Vulnerabilities vary from person to person. It's important that we have a range of supported measures that can be put in place, such as access to health and social services, education and training, as well as intervention providers who specialize in far-right ideologies. There is no single path to radicalization. Because of this, it's important that all those who engage with vulnerable people are able to recognize warning signs that someone is drifting towards extremism. Therefore, we are training thousands of frontline staff in jobs across schools, prisons, social services, and health, a particularly important sector given the number of known far-right extremists who've also had some mental health issues. Thirdly, PREVENT is working with sectors where there are risks of radicalizations or opportunities to prevent it. Schools are being made aware of their responsibilities to protect children from extremist influences, and teachers encouraged to raise issues around extremism in the safe environment of the classroom. In addition, the Department for Education is also working with Ofsted to ensure inspectors have the necessary knowledge and expertise so they can effectively identify risks when doing field work. In <coughs> prisons, staff are trained to identify extremist offenders and programs are available to encourage them to disengage from all forms of extremism. In communities and with local institutions, the police are using training tools to discuss difficult issues. And finally, there is the internet. Sadly, as we know, this can be used to spread vile, hate-filled propaganda, which can have a brutalizing and dehumanizing effect. Our legislation in the UK enables us to take swift, robust action where online material breaks the law by explicitly glorifying or encouraging <coughs> violence as a means to achieve an ideological end. To enforce this, 
we're funding a specialist internet counter-terrorism police unit which assesses online content and where it breaches terrorism legislation seeks its removal where that material is linked to the UK. To date, over 2,000 sites which breach UK terror legislation have been taken down by the unit. We also work with filtering companies to ensure that schools, government offices and public libraries <coughs> filter harmful websites. Additionally, understanding the role of the internet in radicalization and how <coughs> we can minimize the potential for harm is an important part of our wider internet work. I've tried today to convey the extent of the work we're doing to address radicalization and to stop people becoming terrorists or supporting terrorism. The threat from the far right is real, and in recognition of that, we have changed <coughs> the prevent strategy to encompass all forms of terrorism, including the far right. Across prevent, we are learning the lessons from work we've done to address Al-Qaeda-inspired radicalization. And in addition, we are building on the excellent work being done on integration. The challenges, yes, are great. But a great deal of work has been done by researchers, by government departments, and by communities. We cannot afford to lose sight of how this picture is evolving. And through the work of the ICSR and others, and the people you've brought together today, and through the projects that I've referenced, we are monitoring and responding to the situation as it evolves. Because it's only by doing this and continually striving to better our understanding that we will actually stay ahead of this threat. Thank you very much for the invitation. If you could st stay here. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Minister. Um, let me uh, start off uh, with, with the first question. If, if I understand you correctly, Minister, you are basically saying that the whole set of instruments that used to be used for Al-Qaeda-related terrorism and prevent are now being made available to deal with far-right extremism. Is that's that right. correct? That's right. Yeah. No, that, that's right. And it was one of the decisions that we made early on in government that prevent was simply too focused on one strand of terrorist activity. And therefore, we made the decision that prevent should meet all potential forms of terrorism, including the far right. And therefore, as I, I hope I've indicated in my presentation, on issues like prevent, which is about preventing terrorism, on challenging narratives, on looking at interventions for those individuals who have been identified as perhaps heading down a pathway towards terrorism, that those interventions equally apply to far right ide ideologies and indeed a number of the community projects that are funded through Prevent are focused on, on far-right far right issues. And, and how can we describe the balance between the different threats? Is it possible to say it's now 50-50, 80-20, or is that a wrong I, way I, of... I think, I think it's very difficult, uh, and uh, I think it's very difficult to seek to characterise it in that way. What I've, what I've sought to give an indication of is that, for example, on the referrals to Channel, which is our intervention program aimed at seeking to prevent individuals from progressing down this sort of terrorist pathway, that around 10% of those uh, referrals are related to far-right extremism. So that, that's certainly the picture that, that we have seen from, I suppose, that metric. But it's something that we do keep in constant review, that this is a constantly evolving and changing picture, frankly why uh, reports like the one that's being published today and this event I think are quite instrumental in continuing to inform our policy approaches uh, and ensuring that there is a good understanding of the issues that are there. Excellent. Questions? Um, let me start with you, sir, and if you could also say who you are, so the Minister knows. Please. Uh, it's Masato Kimura, Japan New Journal. Uh, I would like to uh, question about the uh, internet. You mm. said the uh, police unit uh, break down a uh, 2,000 site, and uh, what is uh, uh, their tools? And they have a special uh, legal terms or laws, or just they based on common law? Or 
So what are we seeing on these sites? Well, the, we have our counterterrorism uh, internet referral unit that analyzes uh, websites that are referred to them. And, uh, and I think action's taken in around a quarter of the websites that, that are referred to them in that way. Um, and uh, they assess that against some of our criminal laws on glorification of terrorism. They work very closely with the Crown Prosecution Service uh, in, in analysing the, uh, the work. Uh, and therefore there is that bar that is put in place because you know, there is a, a very careful consideration that needs to be given to ensure that we respect freedom of speech. Absolutely, we believe in a very free and open internet. But at the same time, if there are uh, websites that are being used to glorify terrorism uh, and used for terrorist activities in, in a clear way, then steps uh, can and are being taken to address them. Clearly there are also responsibilities that the communication service providers themselves have in responding to re referrals that are made to them by members of the public uh, and others. But uh, we do have this uh, clear mechanism to be able to take action through the CTIRU uh, and I think that that is a, a very important part of our work in seeking to address some of the issues that are there uh, and equally we are continuing to research to understand the ways in which the internet is being exploited for terrorist purposes, how social media is also being used in a dynamic way around that uh, and therefore also how we are able positively to use uh, social media and the internet to put out positive message, messages and information to de-radicalise as well. And this is a, a very important part of our prevent uh, aspects of our counter-terrorism strategy. So, uh, <coughs> John Ball from St Andrews, but also from Reuters. <coughs> um, do you think the authorities have, if you like, adequately mapped um, far-right extremism? And I mean from across the from peaceful to, to sort of sometimes violent to, to terrorism. Do you have a, an adequate handle on, on that, or does more work need to be done? I think that uh, the, the work of the National Domestic Extremism Unit is, is very, uh, very instructive and very important in seeking to uh, identify uh, potential uh, risks uh, and challenges. Uh, obviously, how that uh, can move from the, the, the public order sphere into a, a more direct terrorism environment. Uh, and that, I think I described that, uh, that area in between. And it's precisely the work of the NDEU which is focused on, on ensuring that we have as good an understanding as possible. Obviously, we always look for support from uh, academia, from communities, uh, there is the work the local authorities themselves are doing around uh, the public order space. Uh, and it's precisely these issues that, that I have conversations with my colleagues across government. Uh, the Department for Communities and Local Government works on integration work, but they sit uh, alongside me uh, on our Prevent Oversight Board, which is analysing our work on preventing terrorism. And it's very important that they are there, because whilst the work is separate, it's important to understand the uh, crossovers and the way in which our work in prevent uh, is influenced and can be impacted in either direction uh, in terms of the integration work itself. So yes, there is a, a lot of work that, that has gone on. I think that there is a good analysis that the NDEU has undertaken, but we can always seek to do more uh, and that's why I think that the, uh, the work of various different organisations and groups continues to inform that analysis and it is an evolving picture. Um, and so, yes, of course, we continue to do that work. Just, just briefly, I, it, it was just <coughs> to reaffirm the, the point that I was seeking to make on the, the, the broader work that the Department for Communities and Local Government is involved in on uh, communities that are integrated um, and that the challenges from different, different uh, uh, ideologies or different threats that could uh, seek to uh, undermine those cohesive communities. Uh, and so it is that work that the <coughs> Department for Communities and Local Government are engaged in uh, 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 rightly and that is separate from the work that we are doing 
but it's also sim also understanding how the two do link together, and that's why we do work together closely. And I'm very sorry, I have to cut this off now because I've been signaled that the minister has to leave. But I want to say thank you very much, and thank you very much especially since you picked us to make this very important statement, announcement that I'm sure will be cited for many months to come. So thank you well, very thank much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yes, I mean, thank it's you. a really good amount. So